Hello, my name is Gordon Pauls. I'm one of the volunteers with the Natural History Society of Northumbria. And today I'm going to talk to you about ladybirds. We're going to discuss how you set about finding ladybirds, a little bit about their biology, and how you may identify them. So to start with, here we go, uh, ladybirds for beginners. So ladybirds are incredibly interesting animals. They've got a very interesting biology. We are fascinated by their life history and they're very important to us uh, for, for what they can do. So one of the reasons we like ladybirds, uh, why I like ladybirds is because one of the first signs of spring, when you're out and about on the dull and dismal days of February and March, the sun is shining, and you think, oh, it's beginning to get warmer. Seeing a ladybird sunning itself on a piece of tree bark or stonework or a fence post is really uh, encouraging, and it lets you know that uh, spring is about to happen. But ladybirds are very important to us because worldwide they are very important pest controllers and this has been recognized and we've used them in pest control uh, in many many countries. It is also true that they're a nice easy group to get to grips with. Uh, there are so many insects in the world it can be a bit bewildering to try and work out the different sorts and to start learning uh, the names of different individual species but ladybirds it's a nice manageable group. So in the uh, graphic at the bottom of the screen here we've got uh, a pie chart showing the size of the different orders of insects, the groups of insects in the British Isles. So the beetles, Coleoptera, uh, represents something like 20% of the uh, insects. The bees, wasps and ants, 32%. The true flies, 26%. Butterflies and moths, 11%. And then there are uh, some smaller orders uh, which get a smaller and smaller slice of the pie simply because there are fewer and fewer species. So the ladybirds are beetles, they're part of the order Coleoptera, and there are in Britain around about 4,000 species of Coleoptera, and in total in Britain there are some 47, so that's about 1% uh, of the Coleoptera are ladybirds. In fact, of the 47 species of ladybird, 27 of them are what we regard as the conspicuous, brightly coloured ladybirds you can see on the slide here. But uh, the other 20 are so-called inconspicuous and don't at first glance look like ladybirds. So ladybird general structure, like all insects, the body is divided into three broad regions, the head, thorax and abdomen. The head here at the front. Uh, the thorax of ladybirds is, like many of the beetles, covered by this 
large single plate, the so-called pronotum, the first plate of the thorax, which is enlarged to cover the other three segments of the thorax. And the abdomen in the beetles is usually covered by these toughened wing cases or elytra. This is indeed the first uh, or front pair of wings. Now, hidden beneath that structure, you've got all of the other general characteristics of uh, a typical insect. So there are two pairs of wings. Those wing cases I've just mentioned uh, covering over the hind pair of wings. And if you've seen a ladybird fly, you'll know that they can flip the front wings forward and unfold those hind wings to take flight. The thorax has got three pairs of legs, but they're often well hidden. You probably have to uh, turn the ladybird over in order to see the three pairs of legs unless they're moving around on the plant. And the head bears the eyes and the antennae. So the eyes are quite difficult to see unless you're looking with a hand lens. They're right at the top of the head there. The antennae are these two structures uh, that um, are on either side of the head. Now, as I mentioned, the ladybirds are beetles and there are many different shapes and forms of beetles. Uh, these are a few slides I've taken from my picture collection showing you different types of beetle and if you look through those you'll see some which you're familiar with, others of which perhaps you haven't come across. And you may have come also across the story uh, of the British biologist J.B.S. Haldane who died in the middle part of the last century and this is possibly apocryphal but Haldane was a geneticist who dabbled in and excelled in a whole range of uh, the natural sciences and uh, he found himself talking to a group of theologians who asked him what he could deduce about uh, the nature of the creator from Haldane's study of uh, nature. And Haldane thought for a moment and said mm, he has an inordinate fondness for beetles and that's because there are nearly 300,000 species of beetle known in the world, whereas there are only 9,000 species of bird and 10,000 species of mammal. Indeed, beetles are actually more numerous than any other species of any other insect order. So beetles are great. They're all characterized by having uh, these toughened wing cases. You can see different colors and shapes here. In most cases, they cover the entire body. So if you find an insect where the wing case is covering the entire body, then it's probably a beetle. There are some exceptions to that. Some of the uh, burying beetles have the abdomen uh, showing slightly. And in the case of the road beetles, the wing cases are very short and a lot of the abdomen is showing. But we're not here to talk about beetles, we're here to talk about ladybirds. Why are they called ladybirds? It's thought that this is a corruption or a shortening of the term Our Lady's Bird. Ladybirds, or the most common ladybird in Britain in historic times, is the seven spot ladybird with this bright red coloration of the wing cases and seven spots. And this is thought to be uh, similar to the red robe depicted uh, being worn by Our Lady Mary in many artistic representations. And the seven spots are thought to uh, be similar or to link to Mary's seven joys and seven sorrows. So there was thought to be this, this uh, religious linkage and Our Lady's Bird became shortened to Ladybird. But if you look in other European languages and indeed in other uh, English variants of the name, you can find similar sort of uh, linkages to Our Lady or to uh, God. So uh, in English there's the, another term Lady Cow which has now fallen out of use. In Germany uh, there's a German term which means Mary's Beetle. In France God's Animal and in Russian God's Little Cow. You can see the same sort of uh, linkage there. I mentioned that 
in February, March time, the ladybirds are just becoming active. And it's a good point at which to start talking about the ladybird life cycle. This is the life cycle on this graphic of the seven spot ladybird. So the adults come out of their overwintering in February and March. They feed, uh, start to be active, build up their reserves. Uh, and in the case of females, they're looking for protein rich food uh, with which to produce eggs. Usually in about May time, they will mate, lay eggs. And then you get larvae being uh, hatched from the eggs, starting off as very, very small larvae and they feed and they grow and they molt and they feed and they grow and they molt going through several larval stages until eventually, uh, usually around about the end of July, they will molt and turn into a pupa. The pupa is around for two or three weeks. It's a very strange looking structure. It doesn't really look anything like uh, the adult or the larva. But eventually when metamorphosis has completed, just as within other groups that show this complete metamorphosis like the butterflies and moths, an adult ladybird will emerge and then that adult will uh, spend its time feeding and then eventually as the weather cools down it will look for a place to spend the winter time that is sheltered. And very often they will be found in sheds or outhouses or indeed inside the house. So the larvae don't really look like the adult ladybird. Um, the larva is shown here on the left. Uh, you've got a head tucked away under there. You've got three segments of the thorax uh, and then the segments of the abdomen. And you can see in this seven spot ladybird larva, it's covered in all sorts of lovely bright colors and tubercles. And then the pupa looks even weirder. Uh, and the insect spends two or three weeks in, the, in that pupil stage uh, and then will hatch or emerge rather to an adult. And here is a freshly emerged adult ladybird. The coloration is quite different or slightly different from that which you would see uh, in a mature adult. Uh, the red is less red, it's more of an orange color. Now ladybirds are important to us because throughout their life cycle they can be predatory. Uh, so whilst they may feed on pollen uh, and so on, they will usually prefer to feed on animal food. And even as a freshly emerged larva, they will be <clears throat> tackling things like aphids or whitefly, depending on the species and the availability of food. And then as the larva grows and gets bigger, it becomes bigger in relation to its prey. And the adults also feed on this same food. It's quite an unusual thing for adults and larvae of insects to be feeding on the same sort of food. So many species are important because they're predatory, but there are a few species of ladybird, and there's a larva of one shown on this bottom graphic here, uh, which don't feed on animals, they feed on fungi. Uh, and indeed there are a few of the ladybird group that are herbivorous feeding on plants. And just to complete this uh, sequence, I, I've included a picture here of a ladybird feeding on pollen because pollen is a very important resource for a range of insects where they want a, a protein rich diet. So ladybirds are important in pest control because both the larvae and the adults will feed on the uh, things like aphids and whitefly, which are a pest of our crop plants. And the reason that we feel that ladybirds are very important to us is because they're very efficient at searching the plant. They will move around the edge of the leaf or up the veins of the leaf and search each leaf in turn, moving on relentlessly uh, to find the food. When they encounter some food, they will stop and devour it and then they'll carry out what is called a local area search, moving very sort of tight little circles uh, around there to see if there's more food to be found. And because of this uh, incredibly efficient search behavior, they can devour a lot of aphids and that makes them important pest controllers. And that means that they can be commercially exploited. 
Now, in the winter time, many ladybirds uh, go into form overwintering sites, and a few species form overwintering aggregations. And this slide shows a picture here of a species found in the United States called the convergent ladybird, where these aggregations occur in usually the mountainous areas, but there are so many ladybirds there that people are able to go and collect them uh, and then sell them on for pest control uh, later in the year. And so these overwintering aggregations can be very numerous. We do find that some of our native British species that you can get groups of them coming together, but a recent invader into the British Isles, the harlequin ladybird, here's a picture of a harlequin ladybird aggregation, shows this behaviour far more markedly. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about the harlequin ladybird uh, later on. But one of the problems with these aggregations is if they're occurring in your house, you can end up with a lot of ladybirds uh, inside the house. And here's a picture taken of a house down in the south of England, um, where I happen to be, there are lots of ladybirds in and around the window. Can you see the ladybirds all over the woodwork there? That's not a problem unless you don't like ladybirds, but unfortunately with the harlequin ladybird, when they wake up from overwintering, they can be a bit hungry and they're not averse to having a little nip at anything they land on, including humans. Uh, they're unlikely to break the skin but uh, they can be a nuisance. And also they do have uh, a defensive uh, secretion and odour, which means they can uh, leave an unpleasant smell behind them. So Harlequin ladybirds, uh, which came by themselves into this country, have been exported around the world uh, previously as pest control agents, but they've become more of a problem in some cases than others. As I mentioned, ladybirds <coughs> have got uh, chemical defences. Here is a larva of a uh, harlequin ladybird, and look at that little pustule of, of chemical at the back there, which it's uh, exuding in a process that's known as reflex bleeding. And this is a defence uh, against predation. And so ladybirds, are distasteful. That's one of the reasons we imagine why they have this bright coloration that makes it very easy to spot ladybirds. And I've never been brave enough to actually try tasting one myself, and I certainly wouldn't recommend it. So they're defended from many natural enemies by their chemical defenses, but it doesn't stop them being attacked by a range of both uh, vertebrate and invertebrate predators. So, for example, you can find ladybirds trapped in spiders' webs, and birds and animals and mammals will take them uh, from time to time, but we don't think that this predation is very important. There are, however, some very specialist uh, insect natural enemies uh, and pathogens which attack ladybirds. So here on the uh, bottom right hand slide is a ladybird that's probably almost dead, uh, it's been attacked by a parasitoid wasp called Dinocampus coccinelli. The adult wasp has laid its egg inside the ladybird's uh, body and the larva has developed in there, feeding on the tissues of the ladybird. When the larva is ready to pupate, it breaks out through the ladybird's body in an alien-like uh, sort of episode and then spins a cocoon uh, and the ladybird is left sitting on top of that cocoon, possibly as an additional defence for the uh, parasitoid wasp. Whether these natural enemies have a big impact on ladybird populations is something that remains uh, to be studied further. The left hand picture shows a fungus uh, affecting a ladybird. This is a harlequin ladybird, uh, but you can see the fungus there on the wings of the ladybird. This is a fungus called uh, Labubiniales. And uh, as far as we can see, it very rarely kills the ladybird. It just weakens it, makes it less effective. So there are natural enemies of ladybirds, 
uh, we don't think that ladybirds are at risk uh, from those natural enemies in normal circumstances. Another thing that affects ladybirds is that you get competition between ladybirds, both within species and between species. So all ladybirds uh, will perhaps occasionally show cannibalistic tendencies. So larvae, when they hatch, may feed on the eggs of unhatched uh, brothers and sisters. And some of the species are more notable for doing this than others. And one of the problems with all the carnivorous ladybirds is that they have fairly similar requirements. So if you get two different species of carnivorous ladybird living in the same habitat, then sometimes the bigger, more aggressive one will attack the others and may squeeze them out. And very often we can't see this competition occurring except where a new species occurs. I've mentioned the harlequin ladybird before, where the harlequin ladybird has been introduced into uh, areas as it has recently arrived in Britain. We now know that it seems to have a negative effect on the numbers of both seven spot and two spot ladybirds, which are two of our more common native species. But equally in North America, where the seven spot ladybird from Europe has been introduced, some of the native ladybirds there have shown uh, a decline in numbers. So there is competition between individual ladybirds. And on several occasions, I've mentioned the harlequin ladybird. You're probably already familiar with it, but uh, it was first found in Britain in about 2004. Uh, it was uh, the green uh, squares, uh, sorry, the blue squares on this graphic on the left show you where it was found in 2004. And the first sighting was uh, by an entomologist who happened to be in a, in a pub garden and he looked down and said, oh, look, a harlequin ladybird. And over the next few years, it had begun to spread uh, both westwards and northwards. And so by 2021, uh, the ladybird, the harlequin ladybird is quite widespread uh, throughout uh, England, it's spread into Scotland, it's into Northern Ireland, and there are some literal hot spots of uh, where this ladybird is to be found. So uh, that's a little bit about ladybird ecology, um, but how do you identify ladybirds? I mentioned right at the outset that they're a fairly, fairly easy group to work with. Well, they are because some of the identifications depend on their spot number. So if you look at a ladybird and notice that it's got two spots, then it's a fair chance that it might be, notice I say might be, a two spot ladybird. And the seven spot ladybird has got seven spots. So that, that fused spot there on the, the front of the elytra is counted as one, two, three, four, and then on the other side, five, six, seven, that's seven spots for that ladybird. And then some of the other ladybirds uh, haven't got names related to the numbers of spots. Uh, the orange ladybird is called that because it's orange. Uh, the one ladybird where we have some regrets over the name is the pine ladybird, uh, which is usually uh, dark black with four red markings. Um, but it is not particularly associated with pine trees, uh, but it was given that name and it seems to be stuck with it. So as a starter, count the numbers of spots, but there are problems there. And the next slide will show you why. Some ladybirds are very uh, variable. So here's our two spot ladybird that I showed you on the last slide, but here is another two-spot ladybird, this one with six orange spots on a black background. And here is another two-spot ladybird, this time with four large splodges on a black background. So the numbers of spots is helpful, but it's not a foolproof indication. And unfortunately, the harlequin ladybird that I've talked about several times has a huge number of these different forms. And you can see in this picture, that I took uh, in the Tower of Worcester Cathedral back in uh, 
2010, you've got uh, different forms of that Harlequin ladybird there, uh, lots, so you can't go just by the colour. However, the guides to ladybirds do show this quite nicely, and there are lots of different guides available. So the easy one for beginners is the Field Studies Council Guide to, to Ladybirds of the British Isles. It's a flip uh, fold out chart and it shows you some of the common forms of the uh, species of ladybird that we get in the British Isles. There is a relatively recent book uh, by Helen Roy and Peter Brown, which has been illustrated by Richard Lemington. And this is the field guide to the ladybirds of Great Britain and Ireland. This is a very comprehensive book telling you about their biology and uh, behaviour and uh, species account for each of the species of ladybird in the British Isles. And then even more recently, uh, published this year, is a book called A Field Guide to Harlequins and Other Common Ladybirds, which is uh, highly regarded. It's got some nice photographs in it. Uh, I haven't had a look at it myself, so I can't tell you more about it than that. And then on your phone, you can uh, download, on a smartphone, you can download an app called European Ladybirds, which gives you information about the different species, but it also helps you to record uh, species if and when you find them. And it's recording ladybirds that I want to talk about next because just at the moment we're running a citizen science project called the Northeast Ladybird Spot. So this is throughout the uh, patch that the Natural History Society of Northumbria runs from the uh, Tees up to the Tweed and this graph uh, or graphic with spots on it shows you um, the lady spots, ladybird spot records up until the middle of June. So you can see that there's a great concentration around Newcastle and the Tyne Valley, uh, but people are beginning to fill in the gaps elsewhere. These are all the places that ladybirds have been recorded. And at that time, we had uh, 720 uh, records uh, from uh about 114 recorders i'm just, my presenter view has stopped presenting that's it uh 114 recorders and uh, at that time we had some 17 species uh including the nine target species, which I'll tell you about next. So how do you take part in the uh, Northeast Ladybird spot? Well, you, all you need to do is find a ladybird, take a photograph of it, try and identify it, and then submit your record. And uh, the records, we've got a dedicated link on the Natural History Society website site that will um, take you through to the iRecord form that will take your records. It's as easy as that. Uh, and we have identified a number of species that we wish to target in the Northeast Ladybird spot. So here are our nine target species. Uh, there's information on the Natural History Society's website about those ladybirds, uh, but there's a lot more information elsewhere. Our records are going to contribute to the national scheme, uh, the UK Ladybird Survey, and we are very grateful to uh, the uh, people who work with the Ladybird Survey for providing us with a range of um, resources uh, and uh, help in, in sort of getting the Northeast Ladybird spot running. Uh, if you go to the UK Ladybird Survey web pages, you can find a whole lot more information about ladybirds and their biology and how to identify them. So for more information uh, about ladybirds, then either go to the Natural History Society's website or go to the UK Ladybird uh, Survey's website. And if you need help identifying a ladybird that you've spotted, you can email your sightings to us uh, at the 
email address given on the screen here, or you can contact us on social media and we'll do our best to help. So thank you very much uh, for listening and have fun uh, out uh, collecting and um, seeing ladybirds. Okay.